Uh, hi, I'm Stephanie Goodman. I'm the film editor at the New York Times. And this evening is brought to you by the New York Times Subscriber Events Program, uh, bringing readers the stories and the people behind the stories. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our partner, the American Cinematheque. And I'd also like to thank the subscribers in the audience for the New York Times. Uh, your support really helps us do our jobs. Thank you. Um, before, uh, I'd also, uh, we're here tonight to introduce our new award season columnist and to talk to the Times' experts on the movie beat. They're the people who can tell you what to watch, what not to watch, and who are the real, uh, who's really in the running for the Hollywood prizes this year. Uh, first up, we have our moderator, Aisha Harris, who's uh, an assistant television editor on the Times' culture desk. She was previously at Slate as a culture writer and editor and uh, a host, of, or the host of uh, film and TV podcast, Represent. Um, <laughs> Next we have A.O. Scott, our chief film, film critic since 2004. He shares that title with Manola Dargis, and he also dabbles in literary criticism for our book review. Um, we also, next we have Wesley Morris, our critic at large. And you might also know him as the co-host with Jenna Wortham as uh, the co-host of uh, Still Processing, our podcast. And finally, we have Kyle Buchanan, our pop culture reporter and our new carpetbagger, our award season columnist. Uh, he's joining us this year, and previously he was a senior editor at Vulture. Yeah, you need to hold the mic. Hold the mic by your mouth. <laughs> he was uh, formerly senior editor at Vulture. Uh, welcome, guys. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi. I feel so far away from you all. <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And we were actually discussing this earlier when we got in as we were all commuting to the space. It turns out that the Academy Awards has announced its new host. And its new host is none other than Kevin Hart. <laughs> we all have some thoughts about that. So <laughs> we figured we would just kind of jump in to that. Kyle, as our resident carpetbagger, how do you feel about that? I'll say one positive thing about Kevin Hart hosting the Oscars, uh, and then I reserve the right to change my mind. Um, what I can say is that he's always wanted to host the Oscars, and that is weirdly a rare thing for men who host award shows. They act like they'd rather be anywhere else. So I think to have somebody like Kevin Hart out there is at least going to sort of amp up the enthusiasm for it. It sort of speaks to what I think is the problem with the Oscars, some, uh, something that they're reluctant to solve, which is they want to shorten the show, they want to almost apologize in advance for the show. If you just get somebody out there who's like, yeah, it's going to be kind of long, but every minute of it is going to be great, that trickles down. That makes the audience more involved, I think. What about you, Tony? I mean, I can think of so many worse choices. Um, <laughs> you mean so, like Michael Che and Colin Jost? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, or I mean, or like I feel like uh, you know just about everyone who's hosted in the last five or six years. But because I, I think there's a real structural problem with the broadcast, which is that the, the awards have kind of gone in one direction. Um, and the movie industry is more or less happy with the direction that they've gone toward, you know, smaller scale, less commercial, um, you know, more, more interesting in a way movies. Um, but the broadcast still has to attract a global audience and, and be a kind of a consensus event of a kind that doesn't exist anymore in, 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 in popular culture. And it's almost impossible to think, like when I was a kid it was, it was Johnny Carson, and before that it was Bob Hope, and then it was Billy Crystal, and these sort of figures who nobody especially thought they were all that good at it, but they represented a kind of mainstream consensus that at least on television used to exist in American culture. And I'm not mourning the passing of that by any means, but it's just, 
interesting that it doesn't exist anymore, but the Oscars are one time a year where somehow there's an imperative to pr pretend that it does. I mean, I'm always down for Whoopi to come back and host. I would be very happy for that. Or a woman, period. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Ellen was good. I think Ellen and Whoopi were both great hosts. I think the year that Whoopi hosted and came out as Judy Dench and Shakespeare in Love, um, I think that, I, I don't know, I, I can't judge Kevin Hart's Oscar hosting because he hasn't done it yet, but I mean, he's hosted other things and I hope he hosts the Oscars better than he hosted those. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> I mean, Glad he wants to host the Oscars. He didn't seem to want to host the MTV Video, the MTV Movie Awards. So I, yeah. I'm just saying, this is like a. Didn't he do that in LA Live too, like on a stage in front of a fountain? I mean, with that Dwayne was, Johnson. Yeah, it was weird. Him and The Rock just. Who also should host the Oscars? I mean, if the Oscars are so determined to get people like Dwayne Johnson or Ryan Reynolds on the show, then host. Have him host. But that seems to solve the problem. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Dwayne I'm not Johnson so or sure. Ryan Reynolds? What's that? I just, one of those things was not like the other. I don't know. <laughs> Did Hugh, I mean, Hugh Jackman and Anne Hathaway should just do it. Anne Hathaway <laughs> wants to do it. She would happily do it again. She was, she did it with a zombie the first time. <laughs> and, I think if you, like, she and Hugh Jackman, I think, I mean, there are any number of, com if you want to have a combination host thing. There was a year, was it nine, was it 89 for the 88 movies where there was no host? That was the Rob Lowe, that was the Snow White. Oh, uh, yeah. I hope using number. But, but that was also a year that had no host. No host, yeah. And you would just have, you know, Goldie Hawn and... You know, Alfre Warder was not Alfre Warder because she wouldn't have been at the show that year. But like, you'd have like Goldie Hawn and uh, Susan Sarandon come out and and just present an award together, and nobody would say anything about anything, and the show would just go on, um, literally just go on. Um, it is sort of a sort of overrated element. I mean, so, the host does, does the monologue, kicks things off on the right foot, and then kind of disappears for most of the show. And the host is also the scapegoat. I mean, the host is also the thing about the show mm -hmm. that everyone can blame, that everyone can hate, that, that you know, will, will strike the wrong note. And, and I think it is... I think at this point you, you have to be either masochistic or, or brave or a complete egomaniac to think that that's not going to happen to you. Fortunately, Hollywood stars happen to be all three. <laughs> there's, no, there's no short supply, I guess, of, of such people. Yeah, so have fun, Kevin Hart. You'll, you'll enjoy that. We wish uh, you the best. We really do. <laughs> so, Kyle, you are now our resident carpetbagger, and in your sort of introductory piece for this role last week, you wrote about the question that people often ask you, which is like, do the Oscars still matter? Or like, why do the Oscars still matter? And you, you laid it out pretty well, but can you sort of elaborate a little bit um, in case folks have not necessarily read it yet? Um, in terms of like, one of the main arguments you made is that the Oscars, one of the reasons it matters is because it is sort of like a, a thermometer for where the industry is right now. So where do you, like, what is it telling us right now? This is what the industry uh, thinks of itself. This is where it's going. What do you think of that? Well, I think if we look at what's probably going to get nominated for Best Picture, we should end up with a crop of movies that will tell us something about 2018, a good cross-section where, you know, a generation from now you can look back and be like, oh, yeah, that's where Hollywood was. You will probably have Black Panther which represents you know, our superhero-saturated tentpole era. Um, probably Roma, which you know, a representative of Netflix's incursion into all things pop culture. And then you have A Star is Born, uh, which represents a lot of things, actually. It's uh, sort of a return to old school filmmaking, but also probably proof that something like that, which is this 40 million, I think, uh, musical drama about adults and their feelings and romance. That's not something that could probably get made if it weren't already based on pre-existing material. Certainly not by Bradley Cooper, who had never directed a movie before. And probably not even at places other than Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers is a, a studio that is now in short supply, where they're trying to build those ongoing relationships with uh, directors, actor auteurs like Ben Affleck and now Bradley Cooper, 
if Bradley Cooper took A Star Is Born, that same $40 million package with Gaga to Disney, Disney would be like, yeah, no. If the Russo brothers who directed Avengers Infinity War took that to Disney after making billions of dollars for them, they'd say, are you sure you've got the right place? And now that Disney has bought Fox and we have fewer studios that can make those movies where you can take those movies, that's a little dangerous. That makes me wonder about things going forward. So, you know, so that's, that's another way that you can look at what movies are in play now and what they say about the state of things. I mean, the thing about A Star is Born is... Just like, one thing? Well, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of things. Um, I mean, I, it, it, while you say that, I also think it has a lot of the classic... Uh, the things that the Academy at least looks for in terms of movies, which is like first time film director, but like film director who we know for another reason. Um, kind of like the whole Ben Affleck thing with Argo. Like I feel like this is just like kind of Argo repeated, except this is a better movie than Argo, but like. There were both movies about show business, which we know the Academy responds to. Exactly, the show business aspect definitely. You have Gaga, who is basically sort of the, um, I guess, I don't want to say Whitney Houston and Bodyguard, but it is very similar to Whitney Houston and Bodyguard, except this She's is... She's better. <laughs> Sorry, Wait, who, Whitney. Who's better? Oh, Gaga? Lady Gaga is better in A Star is Born than Whitney Houston was in The Bodyguard. Oh. Is that <laughs> controversial? You want to lose the audience right away? <laughs> I mean, I, I, like, we don't have to compare the money. I'm just saying that I enjoyed one performance more than I enjoyed the other performance. I love Whitney Houston as a singer. <laughs> Fair, fair point. Uh, Tony, what were you going to say? <laughs> About Lady Gaga. I'm not going to get involved in that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that, that, that Kyle is right. And there's, there's also always um, the, the, the question of what kind of movies the, the, the Academy is invested in. Um, and what, not only what the, the, the state of the film industry is at the moment, but the Oscars also tell us what the film industry's image of itself is at a given moment. And mm -hmm. I think that that um, is something that is in enormous and interesting flux right now. Um, and you can see it sort of in the Oscars the last couple of years, uh, where, you know, um, two years ago, there was the, 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 the big surprise, um, especially to Faye Dunaway and, and Warren Beatty, of, of, uh, of Moonlight winning, um, winning, winning best, best Picture, which is something that, that not a lot of people would have, would have um, predicted. Um, and that seemed to be evidence of, of, of a younger and more diverse voting membership um, in the Academy. Um, since then, you've had the rise of Netflix, which is which is a very interesting and and unpredictable um, and fascinating variable in the in the landscape of of studios and independence in an, in a, in a landscape that had seemed to to be more or less settled for a while. Now seems to have this this new kind of disruptive element um, placed into it. And I, I'm just very very interested in your in your sense of that, Kyle, because you, you you're kind of covering that in the within the context of the of the of the industry. Yeah, what is can you talk about what what is going on? What is well yeah, what is going on and what is going on relative to Netflix in terms of things like the Academy. I mean, in the in the like you can sort of make an industry argument based like filtered through the Academy Awards and Netflix. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm now at a point where I'm shocked to see any billboard in Los Angeles that isn't Netflix. <laughs> They have all this money and they are throwing it at the movie industry. To my mind, aside from To All the Boys I've Loved Before, which was a big hit for them this past summer, they haven't quite had a movie success as far as you know becoming a cultural flashpoint on the level of even sort of their B or B minus television series. Uh, but what they do have is a place where prestige filmmakers can go and basically eat their heart out as far as budgets, you know? Uh, it's remarkable to me that in recent years, a lot of people, a lot of directors who've either 
won Best Picture or had a film nominated for Best Picture, that's the apex of a filmmaker's career where after that, you're supposed to have a blank check. You can go get your passion project made. And what we're seeing is a lot of those people are going to Netflix. Guillermo del Toro is making his next movie for Netflix. Tom McCarthy, who won for Spotlight, making his ne next movie for Netflix. Uh, David McKenzie, who had Hell or High Water, he made his last movie, Outlaw King, for Netflix. Uh, Cohen Brothers. What's Joel that? and Ethan Cohen. And Joel and Ethan Cohen. And they said that they did that because they didn't think it could get financed anywhere else, which is kind of crazy. Um, um, David Fincher shot the pilot for House of Cards. and is, I mean, he's a producer on that show still, right? Like, yeah. Um, so as far as Netflix and the Oscars go, I think Netflix is just sort of trying to seep into every single way that we watch and consume pop culture and to codify that, to canonize that. I mean, obviously, there's no going back. We all have Netflix, probably in this room at least, and it's changed the way that we consume certainly television. And I think, honestly, it's, con it's changing the way that people consume movies, but in ways that are going to take a little while to comprehend and untangle. It's fascinating to me, I have to say, that a lot of people who will watch <coughs> an entire season, binge watch like 10 episodes, sorry. <coughs> Drink that water. Netflix is here, I'm telling you. <laughs> <coughs> I'm getting over a cold. Here, talk. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I would just, I mean, I guess it is also interesting, though, that they, that, that Netflix's movie is not explicitly commercial. I mean, they're, they're, they're quote, Oscar movie, unquote. I also think it's just important to point out that, like, Roma is just an amazing movie and is, a, like, a major work of art from a major filmmaker and isn't some Miramax-era attempt to, like, have somebody <laughs> go to the prom and so you, like manufacture a dress at the last minute and right. push somebody out there. Um, this is, to my mind, I think it's the best movie of the year and it happens <laughs> to have, <laughs> happens to have been, it just, Netflix made it or produced it. Well, and, um, and, and a lot of what they've put out this fall that even the, some of the less high profile things, right? You can't say that these are kind of cynical, middle-brow right, right. prestige plays. I mean, if you're talking about Happy as Lazaro, this amazing, one of my favorite movies of the year, this, this Italian film um, by a young director named Alice Rohrwacher, um, that is uh, a very beautiful and very challenging and uncompromising and very, in a way, uncommercial if you think about sort of the uh, what what we think of as as commercial in the American movie context, even for a foreign language film, is is Netflix. Well, we just saw the preview for um, Private Life, uh, a wonderful movie, I thought, by by Tamara Jenkins, but also not a movie that you could feel like, oh, this is an awards play. This is a you know this this is this is a prestige movie. They're they're um, you know they're yeah they're they seem to be good movies. But what I was going to say is, if I can make it through this without coughing, um, I think it's changing the way that people watch movies, potentially for the worse. I don't see, I keep running into people who don't want to watch a two hour movie. They want to watch it cut up into chunks, like Netflix. But that's not just Netflix, that's just <coughs> TV. Uh, as a, the assistant TV editor at the Times, um, I will say that like I was just talking to my friend here, who's sitting here in, in the front here, and talking about the way in which we consume TV versus movies, where we're in this quote-unquote peak TV era, where, according to some people, TV has sort of surpassed <coughs> filmmaking, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I do think that there is, we've sort of habitualized ourselves to expect, even if it's not an, even if it's not like six seasons of like Sex and the City or Seinfeld or whatever, it's like mini series. You have um, Patty Jenkins has a mini series coming out with Chris Pine next month um, that is, you know, a, it's not a movie, but it's not a full on TV show. So I think uh, Netflix is not necessarily the only problem with that. I think it's in general no. just TV has sort of taken over people's Right, but I keep running into people who say that a two-hour movie is too long, that they don't want to queue it up. 
but they'll watch 10 hours of a television show. <laughs> There's an irony to me that Roma, which opens with this long four minute unbroken shot of Water. pavement being washed. Yeah. And it's just a take of that and the opening credits is debuting on a, ser on a streaming service that offers a skip intro feature. I, yeah, I, I can I can definitely see that point. I feel like there's a lot of different, there's just so many factors now to, to take into account. I will say one thing that I find interesting about Netflix's entrance into the Oscar season is that when you look at all of the movies over the past few years that they've tried to crack into the Oscar season, they've all been either directed by or about primarily people of color. So you have this year, we have Roma, not that Alfon like Alfonso Cuaron, he's it's obviously Mexican uh, a Mexican film. Uh, it's about his childhood. He's already won Oscars. It's like it's kind of different for him. But last year we had Mudbound, um, D. Reese's movie that they tried to kind of get in there, and I think it got cinematography. It worked well enough. And Mary J. Blige. Yeah. And Mary J. Blige got the the nomination. And a year or a couple years before that, you had Beasts of No Nation, Carrie Fukunaga's movie starring Idris Elba. Um, we also had Thirteenth, Ava DuVernay's documentary. So it's really interesting to see how. Netflix has all of these movies that they're trying to break into the Oscar race that are about usually people who don't crack into the Oscars. I mean, at least years before, now we have Oscars so wide and all of this happening. But I think there's some good and some bad happening in that way. Yeah, and it's important to talk about how the sort of current theatrical distribution model is very rarefied. A lot of these movies debut in New York and LA and that's about it. Maybe eventually they'll make their way to the middle of the country, but it just feels like a very outdated model. I mean, I was watching Call Me By Your Name last year. That was a movie where it had this very passionate, youthful audience that wanted to see it. But because it was lingering in LA and New York for ages, for like two months before it hit the rest of the country, they just torrented it. You know, Netflix mm -hmm. at least changes that. If you hear about a movie, you can watch it right away. I also think that Netflix is shrewd. They exploited a total vacuum that, I mean, that, that speaks to the thing that you were talking about with Star is Born. I mean, the studios generally do not care about a sort of, I mean, middle brow, um, mid budget, star driven work that does not involve anybody accepting awards at podiums on purpose. Right, like if, if somebody wins an Oscar for, I mean, I was just, a friend of mine just watched Fabulous Baker Boys for the first time a couple of days ago and was telling me, she was taking me through all of the things that just seemed totally foreign to her as a moviegoer in 2018, which is a movie about a woman and two men who just go on the road and sing, and it's not based on anything, and it's the brothers are real brothers, and there's a real chemistry among these three people, and, there's a lot of surprises, and it's warm, and there's a family. I mean, it. This was this was a this was a foreign concept to her, and this is a 32-year-old woman who understands, who lives in Los Angeles, and understands that there's been a shift made, and there is there's a huge gulf, and on the one side are these mega, you know, mega-budgeted, franchise-oriented, intellectual property-derived movies. And over here are the things that come out between September and December, so they have something to brag about when they go to dinner, or feel good about when they go to dinner in February. Um, so I think Netflix, in some ways, it is cynical of them to do what they're doing, but they're also business people who also, I think, like art in some way. But they, there's also an aspect of their business model, of course, that, that makes, that enables this, um, which is they don't have a strong, financial stake, that is they don't expect mm -hmm. a box office return. This is the thing that's fascinating well, to they me. They don't even tell you and that I don't quite who's understand. watching the stuff. Right. So, you know, the, the, the way that it has always been done before in the movie business, you know, going, going back a hundred years is that you put a movie in the theaters and you sell a lot of tickets and that's how you know if it succeeded or failed and that's how you have enough money to make more movies, and the movies get sorted and ranked according to, 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 their, to their commercial performance or their expected commercial performance. Netflix, for now at least, seems not to be 
interested or involved in that at all. They're, they're a subscription service. They want subscribers. They want, ultimately, everyone in the world to subscribe. So in a way, they're going to find something for everybody in the world to like enough to subscribe. And whether or not you know, 10 people or 1,000 people or 100,000 people buy tickets to these movies in theater doesn't really matter to them. And that is just, that in itself kind of turns the whole existing model on its head. Can I just say really quickly, uh, that is true, but if you want to see Roma, please go to a movie theater. On the other hand. When, it's, when it is streaming, don't watch it on your phone, because there are some shots in this movie that you won't, like, you won't be able to see how perfectly and amazingly and shockingly well composed this movie is. It, like, you just, just go to a movie theater, please, also, to watch this movie. Yes. I mean, I'm not saying, like, I, I, just this one movie. Just this one. No, I, I would. I would. I, mean, I, would, I would say the same about half. I mean, all of them, really. But I mean, just don't wa go to the movies and watch Roma if you can, please. It's just too beautiful to watch any other way. Want for the first time for the first viewing. <laughs> oh yes, and support support the Arrow Theater, please. You're sitting in it right now. Well, but it's interesting you talking about financial success and how that's divorced from the Netflix narrative. To divorce that from the Oscar narrative is provocative. I think part of the reason Mudbound didn't penetrate further with the Oscars last year is nobody knew if it was a success. And that is part of the lead up to taking your movie seriously as a contender. Sometimes it can weaken the movie. When First Man didn't do as well as people had assumed, you know, people dropped it like a hot potato as far as prognosticators and early awards groups. So uh, crazy. If people don't know if Roma is doing well, will it feel like that extra little bit that they need to know about is missing? It's just too good for that. I'm sorry. Like, I mean, Mudbound, with all due respect to D. Reese in that movie, I, it, it wasn't one of my 20 favorite movies from last year. And it didn't work entirely for me. Um, I thought Rob Morgan was really great. But, I mean, I don't know. I feel like that... I don't know. I, I, Netflix, I mean, Netflix. Mudbound is an interesting thing to think about in terms of this. I just don't feel like there was any consensus about it being great. Um, and there were things about it that worked, but I don't, I mean, I am a person who did not love that as a, as a entire movie. And I'm, I've talked to other people who feel the exact opposite of me. Um, some people agree with me. Um, I don't know. I thought you were going to say something. I mean, uh, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about this sort of um, divide between uh, the uh, the academy and also the audience that were there. You know, the the people who are actually going to see these movies, because as we know now, the academy is slowly but surely diversifying and becoming less of what it used to be. And and I think a lot of the prognostications are 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 being hinged on this idea that like now that we have a slightly younger, slightly more ethnically and just all around diverse group of people who are voting, like things are going to change in terms of what gets nominated and what doesn't. But then I hear people still like raving about Green Book, and I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I think Green Book is probably going to get nominated for a lot of stuff, and I personally don't think it should, um, for many reasons that harken back to lots of movies we've seen before, whether it's The Help or Mississippi Burning or any movie where it's ostensibly about a black person, but it's really about the white person discovering that like they're not as uh, prejudiced or they shouldn't be as prejudiced as they are. Can we talk just a little bit about like what like Kyle, if you have an, a sense of like how the Academy in the last couple of years since the Academy changed the voting rules, like do you get the sense that things are changing? Like what are the chances for Black Panther? Like all these things that like five years ago would never have been nominated. Yeah, I, I think things are definitely changing. I talked to a lot of Academy members last year who pointed to the best director category as the one they were most proud of. Uh, you know, it had Guillermo del Toro, obviously, who won, but also Jordan Peele and Greta Gerwig. Um, you know, that's where they want, that's the sort of representation that they want as far as the Oscars go. But yeah, I mean, it is still largely older and, and white and male. Um, I'm really interested in the gender diversification of the Academy. I think that when you look, uh, it's something I mentioned in my column the other day, 
But when you look at the Best Actress category, those women often hail from movies that are not nominated for Best Picture, and you can't say the same thing of the men who are in the Best Actor category. And I think it's one of the sort of small, insidious things that, you know, it causes us to not take female-fronted stories quite as seriously. It both reflects how we feel that way as a society, the collective we, and mirrors it back to us, you know? Um, so I think that having a movie like Lady Bird in the mix last year is, is helpful in and that regard. And Shape of Water, too. Yeah, well. and Shape of Water, female-fronted movie. Um, I, I'm interested in seeing that gap close. The Post was a Best Picture nominee. Last year. I mean, something, something interesting happened last year. I just thought that that crop of, pic, that crop of movies was... It and told a great story about where things seem like they might be headed. Um, and, and I think the same might be, be true this year, or I mean, I think it might be, that might be going forward this year. I mean, Wesley and I also are involved in, in selecting the, the, um, the, the great performers for the magazine's um, great performer issue. And this year we were struck, sometimes, in some years it's been hard to find, as it's sometimes hard in the best actress category, to find enough um, movies with, with interesting, complicated, um, strongly acted, you know, um, female leads. And, and, and this year, for really the first time, we felt like there were more women than, than men, that there were more movies, um, whether we're talking about The Favorite um, or, uh, or, or Roma. You know, arguably, yeah, Star is Born, Roma, again, um, Private Life. Um, wait, are we... Are we sick of me talking about Roma? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're stuck with this movie, people. It's gonna, it's, it's gonna win some. But it's time. interesting to, to to get back to to Aisha's point. It's it's always interesting to see what changes and what doesn't, or or what you know the the the, the two steps forward and then the step back might. Um, might might be because it, it is well, there is something fundamentally conservative about the academy of the movies that we chose though i mean we you and i have not really talked about this although it came up once i think only one of those movies is directed by a woman yeah, yeah and that's that's one thing that that I've is noticed. i mean it is the it i don't even know what to call this problem but it's so persistent and so bafflingly yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. I, why it's happening is not a mystery. But the, yes, the sexism that keeps this problem perpetuated is, it's just, it's just, it's crazy to me. Well, even female-fronted movies that often succeed with the Academy are directed by, by men. men, right. And even right. With, with the studios, I think so many times people learn the wrong lesson. You know, when Bridesmaid was a, Bridesmaids was a really big success, the lesson I feel like studios learned was, well, it's because of Paul Feig, it's because a man directed this comedy with a lot of women in it, and he made it palatable. Because truly, all I saw f coming from that were a bunch of R-rated comedies starring women, written and directed by men. Yeah. Bad moms, men, you know. So, yeah, don't, don't ever underestimate Hollywood's ability to learn the wrong lesson. But, uh, you know, you were talking about Green Book and how it's going to get nominated, or probably will. Um, and I think if you look at the Best Picture race and you've got, potentially, Black Panther, Black Klansman, uh, If Beale Street Could Talk, and Green Book, again, it does say something about where we are as a culture right now and what we're grappling with. Two steps forward, one step back, like yeah. MC Scott Cat. But you just saw Green Book for the second time, right? I, I did watch it again. You've seen it it's twice. so bad, you gotta see it twice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys, have you guys seen this movie? Oh, all right. Like well, it. then, it's fasten like your seatbelt. And they love Whitney Houston. <laughs> I, I got us. I mean, we watched this movie together. We saw it together, and halfway through, Wesley was sitting next to me as he is now, and the aisle was that way. And he started to get it. He said, I just can't sit here. I have, was this, I have to wait, was this the fried this chicken was the scene? First <laughs> it was, yeah. it was, it, it's not even a fried chicken scene. It's a fried chicken subplot. Do you want to describe the fried, fried chicken, chicken scene? It comes back. It leads back around. It ties up the whole movie, not to spoil it, but that's what they eat. It's you unspoilable. Know. It's fried chicken. <laughs> it's <laughs> But but you did not leave, and then you went back and saw it again. I which... did. <laughs> with an God audience? You. Yeah, I saw it with an audience that loved it. Um, I have to, I mean, the reason I didn't leave 
Well, it's because I don't really leave movies generally. I try to stay for the whole thing. But I also kind of understand there's a kind of bad movie where you, I always think about my mother in, in a certain kind of like appalling bad movie where my mother was always willing to give a movie, she could see past the, if it was cynical, past the cynicism, if it was, um, if there was a kind of self-congratulatory narcissism operating, which I think is the case in this movie, um, or like a wish fulfillment in some way, she could see past that problem and just see the, find a kind of purity in the relationship between the, if it's two characters, the two characters. She really loved Driving Miss Daisy for the reasons that a lot of people love Driving Miss Daisy, which is that it's a, it's a movie about, from what my, for what my mother would have been an impossible relationship. And I think that, I think there's a way that there's something about Green Book for a certain kind of optimist, and I don't want to cast aspersions on anyone in this room who loves this movie, but I think this is a movie, and I don't know if this is actually true of Peter Farrelly, but it strikes me as a movie, because of the time it's set in and the kind of relationship you have, it's, it's like a movie made by a person who wants more black people in his life, um, but doesn't have them, or there's a, there's a lack of familiarity with, or lack of interest in black people and black culture as human beings, but more about this idea of what having a black person in your life says about you. And I just don't, I don't, I, <laughs> I understand why you might want to <laughs> practice this pursuit in art, but I also don't know why I have to watch your therapy session for two hours. And, and yet, I will say, this is the experience that we had. You get to the other side of this movie and you just can't believe the things that you're seeing after the fried chicken sequence. <laughs> and these two guys are selling this shit. They are playing these parts and they believe what they're doing, and there's something really seductive about their belief. Like Viggo Mortensen, I, I don't know what he thought he was doing, but I mean, he is, he to me is, he is playing the blackest person you were ever gonna see who isn't black. It's, it's, it's a crazy movie. I mean, that was to me. Right, now was... I'm in therapy and you have to watch me go through this. I'm sorry. I mean, that was the most audacious part of it, right? Is the fact that there's literally a line where his character says, like, these are your people. How don't you know who little Richard is? How do you not know who the... And I was just like, are we really in 2018 making a movie set in the 60s in which there's a Italian wise guy who's somehow blacker than the black guy who he's chauffeuring? I don't know, like... <laughs> Well, what Wesley I described, just, the idea that it's, you know, these white people who want a black person in their lives is literally reflected in the billing block where all of these white people made this movie and then they were like, they looked around and they're like, wait, we could get hammered for this. So they brought on Octavia Spencer as an executive producer. That's why she has an executive producer credit? <laughs> For the record. Well, I mean, she also weighed in on the film, but. Yeah, and she also was in The Help. And I feel like five years from now, I love Mahershala, but he might be doing the same dance that Viola did with like The Help this year, where she was like, yeah, there were problems with this movie. And I feel like in the distance, he will probably feel that way as well. And that, like, his character, like, was this blank slate that never really had a chance to develop. It was all about Viggo Mortensen's character, you know, all about his family, you know, all about his tics, his throwing out the, the glasses that the black people drank out of. And we just get all of this white person's projections onto Mahershala Ali. It was like the complete opposite of what we saw in Moonlight. The movie wants to do that. I think Mahershala yeah. is so good oh, and so, so specific, yeah. so specific that he rests a lot of it 
a lot of what the movie is trying to do away from the movie. But Viola did the same thing in The Help. Yeah, no, like I the, agree. The black people are always, the black actors are always trying to elevate yeah. what is there. Yeah. And they can only do so much. It can't all be on that. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things where you realize so many people work on a movie and so much goes into every single scene of a movie that a perfect movie can have bad scenes and a bad performance, or, uh, you know, a great movie can have a bad scene and bad performance. And movies that people don't like, they still have things that where it's clear what people are responding to. And I think in this case with Green Book, yeah, there are a lot of cultural currents that people are obviously keying into. But I think it's also those two actors. You know, they really throw themselves into it in, in very different ways. I, I think this movie deserves to be nominated for Best Picture. <laughs> I, and I will say it deserves to be nominated for Best Picture surrounded by Black Klansmen, Black, uh, Black Panther, and if Beale Street could talk, and like just have to account for itself and what the Academy, the Academy is forced to do as a result. Because I think it could win. <laughs> I really do. And I feel like I, this is why I love the Oscars. Because the Oscars will always tell the truth once in a while about it's the Academy and this country. And I, I, it's a great thing to, to sort of watch this celebration, even when it's a movie that you, I mean, even when it's something like Gandhi versus E.T. Like, the, the sort of virtue signaling that was happening in 1982 or 83 when the awards happened. I mean, I just love this this false narrative that that this organization can tell about what its priorities might, what what it thinks its priorities. Are. Uh, when you say organization, do you mean the Academy or America? Well, the I mean the Academy, and occasionally in some years by extension, America. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we tell false narratives about ourselves all the time. We try to make. You know, uh, people think that things are going better than they often are. It's no yeah, wonder I, that the Academy does it. That's why too. I love the Oscars. It's the exactly. it's one of my favorite things about getting that five to ten movies together every year. It's and just great. That is also why I'm really happy that it is more than five. I mean, I think it should just be an even ten. I don't know why they do the weirdness with could be eight, could be nine, who knows? Just have it be ten. I mean, often my favorite movies that are nominated are what we would presume to be the like bottom tier of those you know, eight, nine, or ten. So just have it be that. It's, it's a, it's a reflects the year better. There's more breadth there. It's not just the five most conventionally Oscar-y movies. Uh, I, I actually think an, another interesting s strand of this is we talked about Beale Street briefly, but if it does get nominated, and if it does, and if Barry Jenkins does get nominated again, he would be the first black director to get nominated more than once in the best directing category. Um, and when we talk about like the, the Academy in general and the first time things are happening, whether it's the first time we had, I think. Um, the cinematographer for Mudbound, she was the first woman to be nominated. Yeah, Rachel Morrison. So when you talk about these things, it's like, yay, we got the first one, but then how do we keep these things going and going? And when I look at something like Beale Street, it seems like the first opportunity we've had where like, it seems very realistic that the same director who is a person of color and who is not like Alfonso Cuaron or like, you know, Guillermo del Toro will get more nominations for just, as opposed to just like one movie that's like, usually you hit that one movie and that's like your one chance. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or just Many. in general when it comes to, you know. I mean, Spike Lee movies. is in the mix this year. Spike Lee has never been direct, uh, nominated for Best Director which is kind of crazy given how influential he has been. Uh, but that also tells you a lot about a lot. Um, you know, and, and honestly, it tells you a lot about canonization uh, that goes far beyond the Oscars, but, you know, walks hand in hand with them. I've said a couple times, it's kind of outrageous to me that Criterion, which has a lot to do with what we canonize and what we value and what we think is important when it comes to movies. It's the high holy temple in what they select. There are more films by Whit Stillman on Criterion than there are by African American filmmakers. So. Wait. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's sunk in. <laughs> But I think it's it's also I mean in in this case it's not just a matter of of individual filmmakers or or individual careers. I mean one thing that has been remarkable in the last few years um, with 
the emergence into prominence of filmmakers like Ava DuVernay and, and Barry Jenkins and Ryan Coogler is, is the way that they support each other and, and network and make sure very explicitly in the ways that they talk about their own achievements and each other's achievements that they're, they're, they're not interested in being singular, unique, you know, kind of all alone pioneering figures. That in a way, that was sort of the, the model in Hollywood for a very long time, whether you're talking about Sidney Poitier or you're talking about Spike Lee, there's sort of the, the, the one person who sort of in, in a way functions within the Hollywood ecosystem the way that Mahershala Ali functions in Green Book as sort of like this, this friend we have, you know, who, who represents our, our own best liberal, imp ours being Hollywoods, you know, that, that, that we're, we're liberal and inclusive and we're fine and now just leave us alone and let us give our prizes out um, to the people just like us. I, I think that there, there is among women and among African Americans and among other historically under or barely represented groups in Hollywood, a, a, a sense of political organization and mobilization um, beyond just the sort of the careers and good fortunes of, of, of individual artists. And I think that's a kind of a remarkable change. I think that's something we haven't quite seen um, at any level of, of Hollywood so, so explicitly, so publicly before. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing that with especially even just like Crazy Rich Asians where you had all of these, um, and when I, uh, I hate to tie them together, but there was a sort of connection between that and a movie like Searching, which was like on a smaller scale. But I remember, you know, John Cho tweeting about Crazy Rich Asians and the cast of Crazy Rich Asians saying, go out and see Searching, like this is a great movie. Like, yes, we have this big movie, but here's a smaller movie that, absolutely should be getting your attention as well. And so seeing that sort of cross-pollination, I think, and thanks to social media, I think social media has many, many negatives to it, but I think that's one of the biggest reasons, and that's one of the reasons we had yeah. something like Oscar So White, is social media and this sort of um, being able to rally around each other in a way that's not just behind the scenes. Like, right. audiences are involved, you see it all happening, and so you can go and feel like you're supporting them as well. But also, and also there's a network. I mean, there, there's there's the, 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 the story of, of, of Ryan Coogler making sure that when he was stepping back from Creed, that, that the that the the person who was going to do the next Creed was going to do Creed two was was Stephen Capel who was his his um, a few years behind him I think at, at at USC but also but to sort of keep this franchise you know um, not to have it just kind of slide back into the into the usual um, faces and and and, um, and 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 to kind of bring someone else up behind him I think that 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 kind of solidarity is a is a within the industry is a is a kind of um is an important and and sometimes maybe overlooked phenomenon but hollywood has a very short institutional memory it's one of the things that hopefully the oscars can correct because you know when you are nominated for an oscar for best director or what have you that is permanent that is always there that is something you can always refer to but the you know the the lessons that were proved by black panther this year were proved amply by Will Smith's global dominance as a superstar like 15 years ago. For Hollywood to not have learned those things then, it was part of the there can be only one scenario as Eddie Will Murphy Smith's star power went. Well, yeah, no yeah. kidding. Um, so it's a little absurd. I mean, uh, just as we are as a nation, Hollywood is progressive, Hollywood is conservative. And I think for a long time, not a long time, but recently, they were blaming their more conservative casting impulses on the uh, worldwide box office, how big China has become. Um, you know, I, I, I heard about somebody who was scripting uh, a big tentpole comic book movie, uh, and the studio was so determined to get a release in China that they said, there's just two things you can't put in this script, lesbians and ghosts because China does not like those. Uh, so I think that a lot of the reason that, that people were you know, restricting themselves as far as casting, as far as content goes, it's just like a, it's a scapegoat maneuver to just go with the same old, same old and blame it on other people. That's why social media is, it can be very useful. Like you said, it, it holds people's feet to the fire. It allows a bottom-up change that, that we're seeing results from. 
So now is the time when we have to go to questions, but I do have to preface this by saying that please make sure it is A, a question, not a statement, and also that it is succinct because we want to get as many questions as possible while we're here. So I, I don't remember who's actually like, oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, so you guys pass them on down. And guys, we're gonna line up uh, right down here so if you're on that side, head on out and then come down this way and then head back up that same aisle, okay? Any takers? Right over here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, first off, thanks for coming to LA for this. Yes, sure. <laughs> thanks for coming to LA for this. We appreciate you. Um, so my question is actually about Regina Hall this season, who I think is just a bit, see, I like that, a uh, very interesting story this season with um, Support the Girls, which isn't necessarily being talked about as a movie contender, but she's being nominated and being talked about with these massive rave reviews. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are as far as her um, in the major awards um, coming up, the Golden Globes, Oscars, et cetera, because um, she was just the first black actress to win with um, the NYFCC. Yeah, the so, Gotham's. Just your thoughts. Um, yeah, so uh, if you heard uh, Regina Hall, she is, yeah, she leads this movie called Support the Girls. It was directed by Andrew Bajowski. This very small budget, uh, small profit indie that came out this summer. But she's so good in it. She plays this uh, sort of harried manager of a Hooters-like restaurant. And the way that she sort of weathers all of these indignities that are thrown at her over the course of a day, she's great in that role. She was great in Girls Trip, too. I know Tiffany Haddish got all the attention, but she was so good. How much she can succeed from here? Well, this is when you start to get into what goes into an Oscar campaign. Money, uh, the ability to get on those round tables, you know, backing. Um, uh, it might be difficult uh, in, in part because of how crowded that category is, Best Actress this year. But as long as, you know, things like the Gothams or the New York film critics get people to see this movie, that's all for the good. That's my favorite performance by, by a, by a, I mean, one of my very, very favorite performances by anybody all year um, in a movie that I love. And uh, Andrew Bujalski, for anybody who doesn't know, anybody who is responsible for giving people money to make movies, give that man some money to make some movies. He is like one of our best directors. He's been our, one of our best directors for 10 years, 15 years. And he has now moved into making a kind of movie that the, the thing that we were talking about before, a type of movie that no longer gets made, but in 1987 and 88 and nine, in 89 and, you know, 93 was getting nominated for Best Picture. I mean, these are, well, not 93. Uh, light comedies that sort of are about people and the circumstances they're in gather a kind of depth and importance as the film goes on, and there's a mind in control. I think Andrew Bujalski is immediately comparable as a writer and director to James L. Brooks. I think in some ways, he's, he kind of surpasses James L. Brooks in terms of the things he's willing to risk in terms of the places he sends his characters. Um, and I think Regina Hall in this movie is, she's so good. Uh, and, but you know, this movie, wh what's the studio? I think, is it Roadside Attractions? No, I don't think it's. I it was, it was no. A24, is it? No, no, no it's no. not A24. I mean, but he's, it's, it's Magnolia. Magnolia, right. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. Um, anyway, there's just, there's no apparatus to do. I mean, if, if this happens, it'll be sheer, it'll be people actually watching an Andrew Bujalski movie, which is very exciting. But I think it is a kind of movie to, 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 to go with what, I mean, I think the, the, the James Brooks comparison is apt, because this is a kind of movie that if you see it on a streaming platform or on cable TV or in some way kind of by accident, you stumble across it, you'll see it, and, and we often get this, where people come and say, I saw this amazing movie, but I never heard of it. How come I never heard about this movie? Where did it, where did it come from? And I think one of the, the, the problems, or, or the, 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 the downsides of the, the pop culture environment we live in, where we're just glutted with so many different 
options that, that tend to come at us through all through the same source, through the same machine, um, is that we miss a lot, and and a lot that doesn't, you know, this, that movie got a lot of traction with critics. Um, Regina Hall's performance is 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 getting a lot of um, much deserved attention, but the ability somehow to to launch that movie out into the world so that the appropriately sized public that it that it deserves um, discovers it is one of the hardest um, kind of needles to thread. Um, for critics and for distributors and for for you know for everybody even when we talked about netflix earlier i mean yeah netflix is throwing all this money at roma supporting it with all these billboards and everything that you know is on par with an avengers movie and yet if you're not roma and you are a netflix filmmaker the best you can hope for sometimes is that your film will be a discovery eventually it's the netflix dump i think they call it which is like maybe you'll find it a year from now, two years from now, they just kind of throw it's it all. All the depends platform. on the algorithm. Yeah. It does. It does. <laughs> all right. Next question. Hi. This question isn't about award movies. It's about mass market uh, sequels and remakes and comic book movies. Do you think the audience today is getting exactly the movies they want, or do you think the studios are making exactly the movies they feel comfortable making? Who's driving the bus? Well, if you ask Paul Schrader, right. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Schrader, famed for writing Taxi Driver uh, and also directed First Reformed this year, he's, I, I have this quote, but he, he essentially said that um, recently that serious movies aren't being made anymore because audiences don't want serious movies. There's no audience for serious movies. Now, define serious any way you'd like. Um, and I, I also don't want to like accuse him of being like old man yelling at cloud too much, but there's a little, it's, it's a tough thing to talk about. I mean, what do you guys think in terms of like, what do audiences want and, and what do you, are, are studios giving them what they want? Uh, besides, I, I think we can set aside like superhero movies cause that's just a whole other category. People are going to go see those no matter what. But when it comes to serious quote unquote movies or smaller movies like our audience is getting what they want i'm not sure that audiences necessarily know what they want until they've until they've seen something i mean i, I think that that it's it's and, and i think that that one way that i do sometimes um find myself a, a, a agreeing with with what paul schrader said is is that there there is among a lot of a lot of the public, um, for perfectly understandable reasons, I think, um, a desire to stay within the comfort zone. You know, if I mean, if the world is just a barrage of horribleness all the time, um, you might want to sit at home and watch something that didn't challenge you, that wasn't difficult, that didn't present any kind of risk to your to your sensitivities or or, or sensibilities. And I and I think that. The 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 I wouldn't entirely blame it on the audiences, but I do think that the 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 institutions that might cultivate a risk taking, adventurous, curious attitude or set of attitudes in the public aren't quite there or aren't quite doing their 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 job. So. You know, just even some of the some of the critical discourse that 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 exists on social media, which is about whether or not you like something, um, and whether or not someone else likes something, and whether you both like the same thing. Liking is one of the le least interesting responses that you can have um, to a piece of art or narrative. I think Paul Schrader is also nostalgic for a time when there were far fewer movies and far fewer television shows. You could have a small, serious drama, and it would occupy a larger place in the pop cultural consciousness because there weren't other things chipping away at that, trying to get their piece of that pie chart. That's something that we kind of can't go back to, unfortunately. Even when we have a success, as he has had with First Reformed, it's going to by necessity have a smaller audience because the audience is distracted with so much right now. Hi. Um, would each of you talk about a movie you're excited about in 2019? It's uh, that's the hardest question for us to answer at this moment in 2018. <laughs> it's like there's just this this wall. 
in front of us, or, or this fog. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I could name a movie that's coming out in 2019. I don't know if I could either. Well, we get so steeped in these movies, because we're, you know, it's year end, you're thinking about your top 10 list, great performances, Oscars. But I, I, just generally, what I'm always excited about is going to Sundance in January, because after having talked about all of these movies for so long, I get to recharge my battery. I get to see movies made by people I've never heard of, set in places I've never heard of, with stars that are about to become stars. It's really exciting to to be able to make discoveries after talking about the same films over and over, which I don't mind doing, but that's that's exciting. Uh, Jordan Peele's new movie is coming out next year, right? Yeah, in like February, I think. Yeah, so that's that's what March. That's what I'm. Ex- I don't remember what it's called, but. The ca- the ca- us yeah the cast is ridiculous Lupita other people's names I can't remember Winston Duke so Elizabeth Moss yeah 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 so that's what I'm excited about well it'd be sort of cheap because there are movies that I saw in festivals this year that won't come out until um, next year I'm I'm very excited for a, the largest possible audience to see um, Mike Lee's uh, Peterloo, which is a two and a half hour movie about um, a massacre of uh, workers that took place in 1819 in um, England, and it's uh, it's 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 very talky, it's very slow, um, it's intensely political. I I loved it. Um, I'm sure all of you will too. So, <laughs> Peterloo. Anything for you, Wesley, or no? Uh, we can just go to the next question. I, I'm really bad about knowing what's happening. Uh, but <laughs> there's this guy named Trey Edward Schultz, who's another great oh, filmmaker, yeah. yes. who's got a movie coming out next year with, like, I think Lucas Hedges and um, Sterling uh, K. Brown. And Sterling K. Sterling. Brown. Sterling K. Brown. And um, I don't know. There's, there's another guy who is a very, very good filmmaker. His third movie he made. Um, um, it comes at night in Cretia. Um, I don't know. He's extremely talented, and I look forward to seeing his next movie. I'd like to ask Mr. Scott, in, uh, in Better Living Through Criticism, you write that, um, that for any good critic over the years, you're going to change your mind about how you view some films. You'll view some more favorably, some less favorably. And in any kind of art, you'll change your mind over time. And I wonder if you might talk a, a bit about that and how your views change over time. Yes, um, uh, the, the gentleman very kindly mentioned a, a, a book that I wrote um, called Better Living Through Criticism, uh, available currently in, in paperback from um, Penguin. Uh, you can, um, I think it might be a conflict of interest if I say you can order it on Amazon, but it's available wherever, wherever books are, are sold. But it, it, it is true that, that you see you know, you, you experience any any movie or any work of art, whether you're a critic or not, at a certain time in your life, and your your response to it um, is is conditioned by that, and also by um, the way it looks at the moment. And 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 there's a long critical record, a very proud, in a way, critical record of error. The longest chapter in the book is called "How to Be Wrong," and it's about how the job of critics is very often to be wrong. To to, because we judge things early and we try to make a decisive judgment very early in the public life cycle of any work of art, our judgment is very often subject to, to, to correction or, or outright um, refuted. As to how my own mind has changed um, and, and the, the many, many, many times that I've been wrong um, in my judgments, I prefer to, to leave the correction to, to others. So um, when I'm asked this question, I never say what what I've changed my mind about, because I just think rather than um, kind of telling telling on myself and and um, admitting how how uh, how foolish or 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 stupid or crazy I was, I'd rather have other people say that about me. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes in both directions, right? That you could like it more or less. Yes. Oh, thing. absolutely. I mean, there 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 are things that you underestimate that turn out to be, you know, masterpieces and things that you thought were the greatest thing ever, and that ten years later you look at it and you're like, God, really? That? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Academy was flirting with like a popular film category earlier, mm-hmm. and um, I was just wondering if you think that's a good thing, bad thing, if that will help with the diversity issue in any way. I, I mean, I thought it was stupid. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do kind of miss it because it would be nice to have this antagonist to go up against all season. Um, 
But I, I, I just thought it was pointless because a lot of the time, really great blockbusters do get in. Last year, we had Dunkirk and Get Out. Those were two phenomenons, uh, incredibly critically acclaimed, nominated for Best Picture and Best Director, for that matter. You know, Mad Max Fury Road won the most Oscars of any movie that was nominated that year. Um, the idea, I, I, for me, I'm just wondering what exactly was it that they wanted to get in that they weren't already getting in? Is it literally? They were trying to account for Black Panther possibly not well, getting nominated. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, I'm not at these meetings. I mean, you would know way better than I, than I. but I think that there was like, we, we, crazy rich Asians in Black Panther, we gotta do something about that. Right. Those, the, the people like those movies. Well, I mean, the irony is, uh, you know, supposedly this was ABC mandating it. Oh, they, yes. They should have checked with Disney and Marvel, who had hired high-powered Oscar strategists <laughs> that um, had a heart attack when that half-assed uh, idea was announced. They, because they thought they, they thought they knew they would will get their movie in legitimately in many categories. I think it might even win Marvel Studios' first Oscar, at least in costume design, if oh, not man. other if races. Ruth Carter does not get an I Oscar mean, come for on. Black Panther. Yeah. Ruth Carter is a brilliant costume designer. She designed a lot of Spike Lee's movies, including Do the Right Thing, and she should... Uh, I will be so mad if she doesn't. But if, if a blockbuster is really good, it often does get into Best Picture, and when it doesn't, I mean, that provokes an interesting cultural conversation. They also the failed to define what a popular yeah, movie completely. even was. Like, what's the cutoff? For, what, like, how do you... How do you measure it? And who's voting on this? Who's, like, when you fill your ballot out... What are the criteria by which you even deem it's popular in my house? <laughs> we like it. The Lucas family loves this movie. Yeah. We at the Denzel Washington, pa Pauletta and Denzel, this is we, number one. Num <laughs> Support the girls is number one in our house. Like, I just don't understand how you would even make the choice, like how you would determine criteria persuasive enough to warrant the, the, the category existing in the first place. Again, it's the Oscars being ashamed of being the Oscars, and they just need to like fully admit that they are weird and wild and yes. crazy, and it's just going to be that way. It also has to do with the broadcast and with just the fact that you know the numbers slip, and we need young people to watch this movie. There's always a freak out every year, and it, 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 whether it's the selection of the host or the scripting of the jokes or something like this popular category, it, it's, it's just this panic that you know, we're not we're not going to hold the audience for four hours of of of, uh, of tedium on a Sunday night. The Super Bowl does not apologize for being long. The Oscars need to not apologize for it either. And I thought it was bizarre that ABC was you know casting, uh, pointing fingers everywhere except themselves. They hired Jimmy Kimmel to host for a second year. He doesn't like doing the job. It's clear he's totally uninvested. He's like, whatever. I'm going back to my normal gig that you can see me do five times a week, so there's no special value to having him host, to seeing what he'll say or do. I think the host kind of does matter. A lot of the time, you know, you hear the argument, well, it's got to be a movie that was a gigantic phenomenon like Titanic or Return of the King. Those were really highly rated Oscar ceremonies. Even higher rated than the Return of the King Oscar ceremony is the one where 12 Years a Slave won. And while that undeniably connected with the country, it was hosted by Ellen DeGeneres, and she knew what she was doing. That's where she took the selfie. She had a, a command of social media that felt very contemporary and current, and she was into it. She was into the job. I mean, I also think that just hiring Kevin Hart was very strategic at this point because if it does turn out Black Panther gets a lot of awards and also Klansman and also Bill Street, it's going to be the blackest Oscars we've ever had. And so Kevin Hart seems like the ideal person to put up there to put him in those really terrible skits where he's like in Wakanda or he's on <laughs> Beale Street or Beale Street is not in home. But like, you know what I mean? Um, yes. Sorry. We have time for one last question. Okay. Um, I know that this is probably, I'm making you guys talk about um, award shows more, and this is probably a tired conversation, television versus film, uh, but seeing as last year uh, OJ Made in America was nominated for an Oscar, um, how do you see longer form television 
question mark, question mark, who knows, uh, being nominated for Oscars, um, especially like the Ballad of Bugs Tree Scruggs and things like of that nature. And do you find like the long, long, long form of being able to tell the story a little lazy or easier? I mean, we're really getting into a state where all of those traditional ideas and boundaries are falling away. Uh, even Netflix, you know, which obviously is pursuing this theatrical release, uh, theatrical exclusive debut for Roma, um, you know, arguing that their movies should be nominated for Oscars. They are movies. They are movie movies. You know, they take movies that get nomina nominated for Best Documentary at the Oscars and try to get them Emmy nominations, too. So it's questionable. We're also in a, in a world where a lot of people who make these television shows say, well, it's really a 10-hour movie. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I guess we haven't gotten to the point where people are saying, well, my movie is just actually a very short television show. <laughs> but maybe we will. It's six seasons condensed into 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> I would watch well, that. Didn't you mention Buster Scruggs? Did you just mention Buster Scruggs? Yeah, right. Which is a movie, they right. apparently- it's a, it's a movie, it's an anthology. The Coens right. apparently originally always conceived it as a movie. It was never right. supposed to, like there's a it rumor is, that it was supposed to be TV, but they said it was never supposed to be that. So you wanna know, so <laughs> this is the funny thing. I think if Buster Scruggs was sold as a television show where you could consume it in these 25 minute episodes, more people would watch it on Netflix. <laughs> it's true, if it was a, a very special six part event. But but I think to, to what you were saying and, and to what Kai was saying too, the, the, we're in this very interesting time where this this boundary, this distinction that it seemed like a natural thing between movies and television. We all knew what they were. Certainly, the critics at the New York Times. We knew who you know what television was and what movies were. Um, and because of a number of different factors, including the emergence of, of digital screaming, but sc screaming, did I say streaming? Um, digital screaming. Um, but also the, 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 the cross migration of talent, both acting and writing and directing, f back and forth um, from, from movies to, to, to television, has just eroded this distinction. So, and I think that's just going to continue. I mean, I think, you know, what a feature film is and what a television show is are artifacts that were created out of certain commercial considerations in the past. So how many times can you schedule a movie to be shown at a theater determines what the length of a feature film is in the course of a day. How, how many, you know, minutes you have between and how many commercial blocks you have you know, is why there are 22 minute and 48 minute long shows and some are sitcoms and some are dramas. But all, all of the, the, the infrastructure that created those distinctions is, is vanishing before our eyes. So the art forms are gonna change and evolve too. So I, you know, five years from now, we might be talking about completely different things. We, we sort of don't know where this is all going. Um, and it will be up to some of these companies like Netflix, but also, I'm optimistic and idealistic enough to hope to the creative impulses of the, of the, of the artists who work in these media um, to, to determine what they, what they look like and what, the, and what the, the new or hybrid or evolved forms are gonna be. Well, on that note, we want to thank, oh, yes. We want to thank all of you Time subscribers for, again, for coming out. We really appreciate it. And of course, you are the reasons why we had these events. We also want to thank the American Cinematheque for hosting us. And thank you, Kyle, Leslie, and Tony. And if you want to follow all of Kyle's uh, carpetbagger adventures and um, Thoughts. He's on at, yeah, yeah. So you can see all of our Twitter handles here, but you can also check out his weekly column on Wednesdays at NewYorkTimes.com and in print that following day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.